Public Safety Performance Project, and uh, Pew is involved in numerous states, uh, and so he's going to explain to us that Colorado is not alone in looking at its, its sentencing laws and its prison budget. Uh, prior to be joining Pew, uh, just so you know, Richard uh, worked for the Department of Justice, I believe in the Clinton administration, correct? And before that, and was a career attorney in the, uh, in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. So we're very fortunate to have Richard here today uh, to hear about what's going on in the rest of the states. So Richard? Yeah, we talked a little bit about kind of who's in prison and, and who is out in the community on community supervision, uh, probation, parole, community corrections in Colorado, that's basically halfway houses. Uh, while you've got two thirds of the population actually on probation and parole, 90% of the spending goes to prisons. Now, to some extent that makes sense. Uh, you know, prisons, you've got the buildings, you've got, you know, 24 hours of, of uh, you know, staff. Uh, it makes sense that prisons are more expensive, but the, the gap between uh, the cost for uh, supervision in the community and prisons is, is quite remarkable. Uh, this just gives you uh, a little bit of the details of the costs in Colorado. So uh, the prison population, you've got three different levels, minimum, medium, and maximum security, uh, $91 a day for maximum security. Uh, parole, regular and, and intensive, $22 a day for the intensive parole, and uh, $9 a day for uh, intensive probation, $3 a day for regular probation. So, you know, we could say, all right, if there is a, if we can do a better job of sorting out offenders, who really needs to go in prison and who can be safely managed and in fact do better in the community, we could double or triple the amount of money that Colorado is spending on probation and parole to ensure that we're not continuing on that revolving door uh, through the prisons and really keep individuals in the community on the straight and narrow, help them rehabilitate, help them re-enter society and, and go from uh, what I'm sure the Independence Institute would like to use the terms, you know, you're going from a tax burden to a taxpayer. I mean, that's what we all want, is we want folks uh, who are going through the criminal justice system to be able to come out and really re-enter society in a way that they can get their lives back and, and um, be a contributing uh, uh, member of the community. Um, so now this, this is just, I put this in just to confuse people actually. Um, <laughs> but but uh, what this does show is, all right, you've got uh, all the states to the right in, I guess that's brown, uh, are states where there's been an increase in incarceration. Uh, all the states to the left in the blue, there's been actually decrease in incarceration. And as you move down from Arkansas at the top to South Dakota at the bottom is the change in crime rate, the reduction in crime. And so Colorado is, uh, has increased its incarceration rate about 40% and decreased its uh, crime rate uh, about, I think, uh, 30% or this is over um, a period of 1997 to 2007. The interesting thing is if you look at, at Colorado, uh, there are a number of states in that same line who have reduced their, their, their crime by just as much but have not increased their prison population or their incarceration rate as much. So if you look at you know, Virginia, Delaware, Oklahoma, uh, California, and Maryland, you know, Maryland is just about at the same level as Colorado. They've had the same reduction in crime, but instead of increasing their incarceration rate, they've actually reduced their incarceration rate. So here are just uh, you know, some similar type of examples. Uh, you've got these three states that have the same decrease in crime rate over uh, the last 10 years, but very different uh, changes in their incarceration rate. Uh, similarly, again, the United States has increased its prison population by 14% with a reduction in the crime rate by 24%. But here are three states that have actually had a better reduction in crime and yet have also reduced their uh, incarceration rate. So 
What's happening now as people are looking at these issues and as state legislatures are examining uh, the issues, there's, a, there's a, a shift in the debate, a shift in the conversation. You know, it used to be the old question was, well, how can I be tough on crime? Uh, you know, because if you're labeled as soft on crime, uh, you know, the, your, your chances of, of uh, re-election uh, a whole lot slimmer. Now I think people are looking at the criminal justice system and uh, corrections and sentencing in a much different way. They're looking at this new question, how can we get taxpayers a better return on their public safety investment? Um, and I, I, I do want to say one quick thing, because I, I don't want to go too far, but I know a lot of people, there's been, you know, I think a debate among uh, some of the prosecutors in, in Colorado, uh, well, we don't want to uh, take action on public safety just to save money. You know, if we're doing this because we've got a, a you know, a budget crunch and, and you know, we're in, in, in fiscal woe, uh, you know, that's not a reason to endanger uh, our community, and, and clearly that's right, but I think the, the point is that savings and improved uh, public safety are not incompatible, and, and one of the things I would point out is that some of the states that have been at the forefront of this effort of re-examining their criminal justice system have done so before, you know, in 2006, 2007, before this huge uh, economic crisis has hit all the states. So it really isn't uh, about we need to do these, take these steps because uh, the bottom line, we just, you know, we can't afford it, we need to save money. The bottom line is how do we improve public safety and do so in a smart way uh, and in a way that's fiscally responsible.